The following is my conversation with Clarissa Burt. Clarissa Burt has experienced renowned success across numerous aspects of her career. She's an award-winning media personality, producer, director, author, and even won a season of The Celebrity Survivor Show. Most recently, she wrote a book called The Self-Esteem Regime, which is a practical guide to help people level up their self-esteem. Tune in to hear more about her story. Clarissa, really appreciate you taking the time. First and foremost, happy Friday. Congratulations on surviving another week in this tumultuous world. How are you doing? (laughs) That is the funniest thing I've heard all week, actually. Thanks for the giggles. I'm doing great. I'm so glad to know, you know, we're like potentially homies at a certain point. That is such a cool thing, Daniel. We are homies. So uh, me and Clarissa were just talking off air for a little bit, but uh, Clarissa is also a Philly girl. So if there's any Philly listeners out there and you hear that hard Philly accent, (laughs) <laughs> you know, uh, is one of us. People say to me all the time, are you from the East Coast? Wait a second, I say, I'm from Philly. It's a whole different thing. Whole nother, <laughs> it's a whole different accent. <laughs> yeah, a whole other ball game. But uh, awesome, Clarissa, you're up to a lot of really cool stuff and a lot of stuff to talk about. But before we get into kind of your illustrious media career as a director, writer, producer, author, public speaker, supermodel, even the winner of a game show, you know, so many things I could remember all that. But uh, before we get into all that fun stuff, uh, can you just talk a little bit about your background story? Yeah. I mean, again, you know, just a, a simple people. I came from simple people, you know, a row house in Philly. And then we moved to the suburbs. It was another row home there and just, you know, regular blue collar people. But, you know, I even as a young kid, I had you know, pretty big dreams. And I just knew in some way, shape or form, I was going to be on a stage in front of a microphone. And you know, I was Mary Poppins in the kindergarten play, Daniel. And after that, I was hooked. You know, I sang supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. I got a standing ovation. And, and the rest is his. I was hooked. You know, I was like, oh, I, could, I could do this. People on their feet clapping for me. I could do this for a lifetime, you know. So um, I, and funnily enough, I didn't do anything until after, until, a, a, you know, fast forward from five in kindergarten to about 30. Um, I, you know, I wasn't allowed to really stay after school a lot. And so when they asked me to be Dorothy in the third grade play, the answer was no, because I had to get home and take care of my, you know, my mom, they, I was, we were latchkey kids. I was the oldest. I had to take care of the youngest. So, uh, yeah, the next time I was on t- television, I was in Italy. I had already, you know, gotten past all the modeling years and, you know, they asked me to come on television, which I did happily. And, uh, but that, that, that's how long it took until I actually got back. So then I did, you know, I, did, I was in Italy. I worked on television there. Um, as ca- as on camera talent, and then after that, you know, I started my own production company where I actually had the Miss Universe pageant three hour li- uh, live broadcasts with eighteen different cameras. So it was they were huge, huge productions. Got it. Interesting to hear about that, and thank you a lot for taking me kind of through the background. Yeah. Uh, quick follow on: How is it like growing up as the oldest? I actually I happen to be the youngest in my family, so curious from from your perspective. Yeah, or- yeah I, I really love being the oldest. You know, of course they learn with you, right? You know, so you're the first. Um, and my parents, you know, um, were very strict because they were brought up very strict. My father went to West Catholic boys. My sister went. My mother went to West Catholic girls. So, you know, 12 years with the nuns and the priests will drive anybody crazy, I think. And so, <laughs> and so, and so we got, you know, by generation, generational trauma of it all as kids. I joke, I jest, but, um, but yeah, it, it, I love being the oldest um, I, because, you know, I just, I love, I'm a caretaker. You know, I, I was born a caretaker. So for me, it just, it was just step into the role and off we go. You know, there was no, there was no, really no, um resistance at all it was just okay i'm a caretaker i'm taking i took care of my mother's kids and and you know my parents kids and then i took care of my parents so we're good that's that's a fair assessment i think there are pros and cons to every age but it sounds like uh, you got the the better of it growing uh being yeah, the older I, last. I had a good time that's awesome to hear so uh, one of the things that you mentioned was kind of a lot of the stuff that you were doing growing up you know being in school plays involved in a lot of activities and <laughs> Ultimately, this led to a really illustrious media career. I'll, I'll once again repeat, like all the different things you've been, it's very candidly too many things for me to remember, but kind of a media personality, a producer, a director, an author, public speaker, working as a supermodel, and you even won a season of The Survivor Show, which is also a, you know, an yeah. incredible thing on its own. But how did you kind of balance all this stuff and what really led you from like one path to the next? Well, you know, it's a, that's a great question. What led you to one path to the next? Because, you know, I think it was always in, it was on kind of like, the blueprint, if you will. I just always kind of knew what I wanted to do. And that, again, was be on a stage in some way, shape, or form. I absolutely love a microphone. I really dig media. I adore what we're doing right now. I just love 
this. And so um, people say, well, what was your favorite thing to do? Probably, you know, I was in about 18 different movies as well. I don't know if you remember The Never Ending Story. I was The Never Ending Story Part 2 as the mean queen Zaida. And um, I love that too, but I just really love a stage. I love a live audience and I love the direct connection. Um, that, you know, being in the movies didn't afford me. But, um, you know, the, the direction is, okay, I want to be, you know, I wanted to be first a model. And then you do that. You say, okay, what's the next? Okay, now I want to act. Okay, and then you go do that. And you say, okay, what's the next? Okay, now I want to produce. And then you go do that. And by the way, you know, you got to like, stop everything and go learn the next thing. It doesn't just flow, you know. Um, and then you, you add, some, you know, a good dose of fear in between one or the other. Like, oh my God, I'm leaving the known to go into the unknown will I ever be able to do this kind of thing and that's always really challenging but quite exciting so if you keep yourself really you know like jacked up about it all knowing that you know next is next and it here we go and whatever it takes um it's it's a cool place to be so yeah for me right now I mean you know I when I came home from Italy I had done pretty much everything I wanted to do except start my own media company. Oh, I had done that, but like start my own multimedia platform is what I meant to say. And so television podcast in a digital magazine, kind of like, you know, Martha Stewart or Oprah. Right. And, um, and we did that. I say, we, when I say we, Daniel, it means me, myself and I, uh, and, uh, <laughs> all three of us. And I can, um, I can relate to that. Yeah. You know, and then it was the book. And so I was on stage, I was speaking and somebody heard me speak and said, I got to write your book. And he's a friend of mine, my name of um, Gary Krebs, there he is right there. And so Gary is a very well quoted literary agent in New York City. Um, I come, I came up to New York to the Book Expo in 2019, walked around, this guy is like the mayor of, you know, the Book Expo. And we got the book deal uh, with New York, you know, with a publisher in New York City. I've been with this book, we've been in Barnes and Noble for the last year and 10 months since it came out. It's an award-winning, a Plori award-winning uh, international bestseller. So I say that to say, yes, it's a crowning moment. Don't get me wrong. But I never thought I could write a book. I'm not going to sit down and write it. I'm never going to sit down and write the book that I wanted to write. It was serendipity. It was the opportunity. It was his offer. It was me saying yes to the offer. It was the, 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 uh, the you know, the connection of working together. Um, we Zoomed a lot. I came up to his house in Connecticut. We met in the city, New York City, about three times. And I just dumped everything on him. I said, here's the name of the book. This is the, I want it to be 12 chapters. Each chapter starts with a reword. This is not, we're not going to read about self-esteem. We are going to do self-esteem. So there's, the book is, you know, it's changing lives, Dan. It's changing lives one chapter at a time. I'll tell you that. That's awesome to hear, and I'm happy you brought it up because that's a really natural transition to the next thing that I wanted to talk about, which was your book. And, you know, I know you said before that you thought to yourself, oh, I would never write a book. Like, books are 200 pages, which, you know, that's the, that's the thought process I have right now. I mean, never say never, but, like, yeah. I'm a frequent reader. I'm actually – I'm reading um, Michael Lewis's Moneyball right now. So I've seen the movie, but just kind of learning more from the book. And it's, it's a great read, but I can't imagine writing 300 pages. So would love to know ultimately how you got to that – got to that state of mind where you were like, oh, I'm going to write a book. And, you know, ultimately why you decided to write a book. Well, because there are different stages that you have to go through. And by the way, you know, people say, oh, have you ever like, you know, no, you never take a test on self-esteem and get a hundred. It never worked. It doesn't work that way because life is life. It's going to trigger you and just, you know, and then and put on your seatbelt and get ready for the ride. Right. Because it's just the way it is. So, you know, I talk about standing really strong in your stead as, you know, as, as, as a well-rooted tree would do. So when the storm comes through or that hurricane is coming through, it's like batting down the hatches and there goes the storm. And after the storm, you might have, lost a leaf or two, or you could potentially even have lost a branch, but you're not going to be uprooted with the storm and transported away, right? Because you've got the tools in the shed that you need now on any given, any given time in any given moment. And that's when I talk about it's your sacred duty to work on your personal development, to be the better person more than you are today. You know, people keep thinking about, you know, that you, that you, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sorry. Uh, you compare yourself to other people, right? Oh, I'm comparing you, especially with social media. We're all driving ourselves nuts thinking that the guy really does have two Lamborghinis in the driveway when we all know it's not true. Um, and so, you know, we're driving ourselves nuts. At, by the way, there are two different things about that. Let me, let me stop a second. And that is, you know, we always think that the grass is greener on the other side, right? Well, okay. I'm going to say that the grass is always greener where you water it. It's a bad point. So, 
worry about you do worry about you. And then is the grass really greener on the other side, Daniel, or is it astroturf? It's also, that's a great metaphor that I think about it because you can never really tell I what's on the up, I made that up all by myself. I'm so proud of it. But is it astroturf? Is it fake? Is it not real? Is it just perception? You know, bring it in, reel it in. And the only uh, comparison you need to be making, honestly, is the comparison to you and who you were yesterday. That's it. Sure. Don't worry about anybody else. Um, uh, and I forget what I was saying before that, so ask me another question. <laughs> yeah, no worries. All good. Look, we, we this is a, a conversation, really like some of the stuff you're bringing up. And, yeah. you know, I think that the last point you made was really valid. I think a lot of times, and a thought that I've definitely been juggling with recently, and, you know, I've also had a bit of a tumultuous personal life, but it's the sense that, you know, we have to ultimately as humans kind of come to the rationalization that, you know, life isn't fair. People are born into different circumstances. But with like the rise in social media, it's so easy to compare yourself and look at other people. So do you have any advice for ultimately how we can, you know, be at peace with life being unfair and just kind of do our best every day and try to focus on ourselves as opposed to, you know? I mean, absolutely. First of all, you know, it's perception, isn't it? A lot of times it's what they want you to know. It may not necessarily be what's true. And until you've walked a mile in anybody else's shoes, I'm going to say, mm, you know, it's all good and it sounds great, but is it really true? And even if it is. You know, it's where you it's where you put on your big boy britches and go, you know what? I'm really I'm really happy for the guy. I'm really happy for that girl. She's worked hard. She deserves it. I'm thrilled for her. And that's when, you know, you have stepped into a whole different realm of self-esteem and that you're you know, you're showing up for yourself. Right. You may not be where they are. You may not need to be where they are. You might be, you know, doing something completely different. But what I'm saying to you is. You know, that is also a really good, it's a, it's a good indicator of your emotional intelligence, your, emo, your emotional quota, right? Like how emotionally evolved and mature are you, right? Not live in jealousy and be worried about what everybody else is doing because it's not about that. It's about you. It's about your journey. It's about your path forward and how you're dealing with that, right? So let's let's get really, really clear about that. Um, yeah, and sure. that's where I would leave that. You know, you also have to have, and when I when I talk about self esteem and the really good things about it, uh, one of the first things I say to people is, okay, well, you know, people say, how do you how do you get great, you know, good self esteem? Well, drop and give me five, five at least, give me four. Like, where, what are your, what's your value system? People will say, I mean, value, I don't even know. A lot of people don't even really know what values are. They're not really clear about it. Well, I am really clear about it. And I know that my value system is my blueprint. It's life's blueprint. What will you accept? What are you not willing to accept, right? How will you be treated? How are you not willing to be treated? You gotta be really clear about that stuff. So I do what's take, what, what is called taking the high road, which is honesty, integrity, gratitude and honor okay and so when i come to the table i come with that blueprint that's exactly you know exactly what you're going to get from me well first of all what what i bring to myself but what i bring to the table what i bring to a meeting what i bring to a relationship it's that important um that you are really really clear about all of that first off the next thing are like the four pillars of self-esteem and my four pillars in the book are look good feel good be good and greater good. It's outside, inside, head, and heart. It's outside, okay, taking pride in your appearance. We all know that when we, you know, we feel like we're looking good, we got a lilt in our step, we're feeling good, we're feeling ourselves, right? For sure. you know, inside, diet, exercise, nutrition, it's all connected. You get one body, you need to be taking care of that for a long time, right? So make sure you're on point with that. Enough water, supplements, whatever it is you do, to, you know, do to you, do you, do you, right? So you're going to look good. You're going to feel good. You're going to be good. And be good is basically like relationship, um, leadership, your finances, your business, all the other stuff that you do to be could be your, your it could be your faith. It could be going to church. Whatever that is for you is really, really, really important. And the last thing is um, look good, feel good, be greater good. Greater good, paying it forward, tithing, volunteering, doing something good for the community, like, you know, paying it back in some way, shape or form. Really, really important stuff. And when I say that, people say, oh, I don't have enough money. I don't it doesn't have to be about money. It could be a smile. It could be a compliment. It could be holding an elevator door, like kindness, Michael. Just a little, little, uh, uh, I'm sorry, did I call you Michael? I meant Daniel. Um, a, sorry, I, I was with 
on the podcast with Michael before. Daniel, sorry. Clarissa, um, like, Clarissa, this stuff happens. Don't worry whatsoever. That's life. You know, we're just shooting the shooting the shit here. Cool. So just so you you know, those four uh, those four pillars of self esteem are really important as well. So if you got your value system, you got the four pillars. You know, um, I think you're going to be in a good place to you know to really get started on the work that needs to be done. Awesome. I think you know couldn't have said it better myself because I didn't write a book and you did, but I think that was a great, great way of looking at it. Uh, the one thing I wanted to shamelessly plug here, so not to draw too many parallels between kind of self-esteem and religion, but uh, I think I've mentioned this on another podcast, but there's like a concept in Judaism called Maser, which is like, you know, whatever your income, 10% of it donate to charity, whether it's like a synagogue or like any organization or just, you know, 10% just a giveaway. And the idea is that one, not only does it bring kind of, you know, good karma in some kind of way, but it also, it feels good. You're just more lively. Like you have, you have better intent. So, you know, while, you know, religion and kind of in a, you know, conference and whatnot may be similar, but definitely don't want to, you know, force the two together. I think yeah. it's interesting that there's that parallel and, you know, and just, like forgetting about religion for a second, if you're practically thinking or if you're frequently giving charity, you almost have like a, it's like an intangible force inside you to keep going, to do good. And like, you know, that force is what really keeps you going. And while you certainly have hard days, I definitely think it's something that's beautiful and gives people a much more fulfilling life. It. Perfect. Perfectly said. I couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. And that's the thing. I think that, you know, we really need to be, you know, just really checking in with our soul because it really is, you know, that's like a really good indicator of, 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 you know, what direction your soul is going in, uh, is how kind you are, you know, and that's just, it's just really, it's that important, I think, to be doing really, like really nice thing. Again, it could be a compliment. Like I could be at a supermarket and just go, Oh, I love that top. You know, it's silly, you know, and someone will go, Oh, well, thank you so much. It's that silly, but I made her feel good. I'm feeling pretty good about making her feel good. Win, win, off I go. Next. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be, yeah. we don't, you know, we're the ones that complicate things. It doesn't have to be that complicated. Just, you know, have a good heart. And if you don't start working on yourself, again, it's your sacred duty to, to work on your personal development every day, just like you'd work on anything else. Um, and it's a tough go. It's not always easy. You know, we're, we're human. Uh, we get stuck in a rut. We get stuck in old ways. We, you know, we think that, you know, the things that we've been taught are, you know, it's etched in stone that they can't be, you know, they can't be changed. Mom and dad were absolutely on point about everything they ever taught us. Uh, faith as well. I mean, a lot of times, you know, there's a, a little bit of a head scratcher when it comes to things, you know, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people that they, they do have right. scratches when it comes to their faith. So, you know, again, you know, you forge ahead, forge your path, but do it with, you know, do it with a plum and do it with a good heart. Yep. Good faith, I think, is huge. And I think the, the biggest thing I was trying to say, and I think this may draw everything together, whether it's through like faith or whether it's just through like, you know, being a good person. The point is like, you know, whatever your background or beliefs are, just try to be a good person in the world. And ultimately, the world will smile back on you. Yeah. 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 No doubt. No doubt. Cool. Awesome. Uh, the other few things I wanted to get into, you know, it's more specifically about your book. Uh, there are a few big points that I wanted to touch upon and just to see if you could speak a little bit deeper into these and ultimately how people could use these to really gain more confidence and grow more self-esteem. So one of the things that you discussed in your book, uh, among others, is mirror therapy. So can you speak to a little bit about what yeah. that is and how people could use that so, to better mirror themselves? Therapy. I first read about uh, mirror therapy with Louise Hay. So Louise Hay was an, a titan in the personal development industry and one of the, one of the one of the first, not the first, but one of the first and one of the most quoted. The second one was Jack Canfield, who was, you know, the half of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. Uh, and so they both used it in their works. And if they could use it, certainly I could too. And that is when you become your best. You become your your own rah-rah session. You are your own cheerleader. And you tell yourself uh, things that you need to hear. You tell yourself the things that you wish maybe others would say. But if we wait for them, we could be waiting a really, really long time. So that's also, you know, it's getting in front of the mirror. It's going to look weird. It's going to feel weird. It's going to sound weird. And you're probably going to want to do it in nobody else's home. Uh, some people may need a tissue because you might get, you know, really deep with some of this stuff. When you do you, it's your journey. But getting in front of that mirror, there are two ways to approach a mirror. One of them is to look at the mirror. And that is when we're brushing our hair, doing our makeup, brushing our teeth and all that. And the other one is to look into the mirror. And when you look into the mirror, you're looking into your soul. And that's when you stop and you take a couple of deep breaths and you never break, you never break uh, 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 the, the uh, glance or the stare uh, that you have into the mirror. And you take a really deep dive and you say to things to yourself like, you know what? I really like you. 
You really do. I really like you. And let me hold on. I really, I, I love you. I love you. I really love you. And I forgive you for X, Y, and Z. Um, I know you did your best. Um, and by the way, great job on that presentation on Thursday. I really wanted to check. It's going to look really weird. It's going to feel even weirder. I'm telling you, it is some of the, it is really probably the most impactful exercise in the book. It's weird, but be ready to stump, step out of some comfort zone when you start working on your, you know, self-improvement, personal development, when you, this is again, being a better person more than you are today, really wanting to see the light at the end of the tunnel, because one of the other things I wanted to touch upon while we're, while we're at it is, you know, the, the, you know, youth mental health crisis that we're all going through right now, or all okay. the world is going through right now. I'm not going through it anymore, but many are. And we, we hear that from our own, uh, you know, the um, attorney general, uh, he came out and said it. And, um, and that was pretty scary when he came out and said, you know, we've got a youth mental health crisis. The Dove self-esteem project is coming out and talking about getting our young kids away from these filters on social media because they're not living in reality. You know, we've got eight, nine and 10 year olds that are putting these, you know, glorifying, really making you super gorgeous. I think the, the filter is called the bold glamour filter. And so, you know, Dove came out and spoke about, uh, 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 out against this. And so the CDC has come out with numbers, um, Daniel, that are alarming when they say 45 to 50 percent of our kids are either depressed, anxious, thinking about committing suicide or have committed suicide. And I know today they say on aliving the word, however, the semantics are, the, the, you know, it's still it's, it's horrible what's happening. And so we have to really be mindful, all of us about, you know, really checking in with, with our youth, who are they, where are they, how are they doing, you know, maybe getting the, the devices out of their hands to you know, get back to the kitchen table, you know, let's, let's get, it's dinner time, everybody devices down. We're spending the next hour together. Help me chop the onions. Somebody set the table. How was your day? Well, let me tell you what happened to me and get back to, you know, that the family get, man, if you don't have a family, a lot of people are like, well, we don't have all of that. Mom is working, you know, try to do your best to make it on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock for now. I don't care, but get back to what's really, really important. And what's really, really important is human connection. It's a human touch. It's a hug. It's a pizza and popcorn snuggled up on the couch watching, you know, Netflix. I don't care what it is. It's just the time together without the device. Now you might say Netflix is a device. The TV is a device. It's different. You know, we spend a lot of time. There's a saying about social media. It was really cool. It was something it goes something like this. We, we spend a lot of time close to one another to be in connection with people far away. Right. That aren't in the same room. And Deep. I forget exactly how it goes, but that's how it starts. And you're like, yeah, you're right. You know, like if somebody's right across the table from me. I mean, I know people that text, that text one another in there and they're living in the same house. You know, it's just like, it's crazy, you know, the proportion that it, what kind of proportions we're looking at when we're talking about, you know, not, not spending the time together and how much time we're spending on the devices. It's scary. It's just really, really scary. So I bring that up because I think it's, it's that important and, um, we need to be, you know, we need to be doing different things with these kids than watching them with their devices in their hands all the time. Yep, for sure. I, I really like the phrase that you mentioned earlier, devices down. I feel like that's something that could really be implemented. I can almost imagine when I'm older, I don't know if I'd have this, but say, for example, if you sat at the living room table and you had like, uh, you know, those restaurants, they have like the open slash closed like uh, signs, like the electronic ones. Like if you just like hit a lamp switch and then it just said like devices down and then everyone just <laughs> just put their devices down. But I think uh, I think that's also a good point. And uh, one of the things that you said earlier, just regarding mirror therapy and like standing in front of a mirror uh, maybe I don't do it as deeply, you know, maybe it could be good practice, but sometimes when I wake up and I just, you know, use the restroom or like brush my teeth or whatever, I don't know why I think of like the, I'm like an averagely funny kid or, you know, maybe that's what I think of myself. Maybe some of my friends think uh, I'm funny or maybe I'm, I can't tell if they're laughing with me or at me, but that's, that's another story. But always a class clown too. I get you. Yeah. But uh, some of the funniest jokes I come up with are like funniest things are just like when I'm looking in the mirror and I just I don't know why, but like something maybe something about like reflection makes us think in like a silly way. So I can definitely uh, definitely attest to that. Um, but really interesting conversation around that. Another really cool point in your book that you brought up that I think a lot of us go through is betrayal. And specifically, you talked about betrayal trauma. So can you speak a little bit about to like what that is in your eyes and how people can kind of move on from that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, betrayal trauma, is it's really deep. It runs really hard. I mean, here's a deal with betrayal trauma. And, and this is something that we all need to know and understand a little bit better. And that is, 
you have a responsibility when you take somebody else's heart into your hand. I'm going to say it again. When you love someone or tell someone you love them, right, and they believe you, that's a responsibility, Daniel, that that's on you. If you're saying to somebody, I love you, and you don't, you're, you really are a cad. You really are a cad. And it's a violation. It's a huge violation of trust, number one. And there are different types of, of betrayal, right? So it could be cheating. It could be financial infidelity, right? It could be hiding bank accounts, right? It could be um, not sticking up for your partner in front of a group, like, you know, real, or talking down to your partner in front of other people. That's nasty. Lying is betrayal disrespect of any kind is dis, is really uh, a betrayal. Um, using your partner's past against them is another kind of betrayal. And so it's not just cheating. Betrayal is not just cheating. Betrayal is, is when you're, you know, it's, it's, it's when you are doing something that make it, that shatters someone else's self-worth. I think that's a, that's a really great, uh, great point there. And especially something we all go through and a lot of different examples of it. But, you know, when someone goes through a kind of that situation or is on, unfortunately, the receiving end of it, is there any anything that you'd recommend people do to try to kind of emotionally move on as difficult as that may be? Yeah, I mean, you know, go through it. You're going to have to go through it because, you know, relationships are, a, <laughs> they're a very funny place to be and they could be really... Um, yeah. They can be really challenging. We all know that, right? So relationship is, um, you know, when you're in a relationship, a couple of things we need to remember is, first of all, you're, it, it, there are three of you in the relationship, or there are three ways to approach this relationship. One is you are in a relationship with yourself. They are in a relationship with themselves. And then you have the relationship together. And so are you both coming to the relationship whole? Um, and so that's, you know, or is it, or is there going to be this kind of like codependent kind of situation going on? So you have to be really mindful about that at the beginning, before you give your heart away, it's on you to make sure that, you know, you really have to like guard this heart really well before you just go Bleh, and give it away to somebody. Right. Mm -hmm. Because you're never going to find peace, Daniel. Um, you're never going to find peace with somebody that's at war with themselves. Right. Sure. Um, you know, and, and if you think that someone else is there to complete you, then you're already in trouble, right? That's not a good thing. So you don't want, you know, you don't want somebody else. Nobody else is supposed to be making you happy. You come to the table happy. You come mm -hmm. whole. You come complete. And for God's sake, come correct and come honest. I think that's a, that's a great way. You know, I think the best way to summarize that and would love to hear if you agree with this, but it's almost like make peace with yourself and then you can make peace with anyone else. In yeah. A way. yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, just don't ever ignore the red flags in people just because you want to see or try to find the good in them. The red flags are there, even if they're pink flags. <laughs> You know, they're not quite red yet, right? I kind of look for the pink first. And then, you know, and then, you know, we move forward. And look, nobody's perfect. We're not perfect. But we also know that we don't want to live in toxicity, right? Um, when we talk about generational trauma, we talk about a lot of different, um, a lot of different traumas that form us. They can be devastating, right? And so what we don't want to do is to give our heart away to somebody when, when, you know, we ourselves are not whole, we also need to heal. We need to go through that, the healing process and then go through that first. Don't be looking for somebody when you've got a hurt heart, because that, that's just a, that's a recipe for disaster. Yep, totally. I think that was beautiful advice and definitely something, well, we're not all perfect, something we could all practice for, but Clarissa, really awesome you sharing that. Yeah. You know, another thing to get back to to another high note uh, regarding something you mentioned in your book is practicing gratitude. So how do you think practicing gratitude, you know, whether it's a weekly, daily, whatever works for someone basis can really yeah. help someone uh, elevate themselves? Yeah, I mean, gratitude. It's 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 really it's one of those things that you need to be doing before your feet even hit the ground in the morning. It's like, God, I woke up. Thank you so much. 
first of all, I'm awake and thank you for the warm blanket. Thank you for a soft bed. Thank you for the food that's in my pantry. Thank you for the coffee maker. I don't know. Thank you for the people that love me. Thank you for my job. Thank you for the abundance. Um, thank you for my health. Thank you. I, I, I don't know. I just give you 10. I could drop and give you 10 more if you need me to. But, you know, I think that we need if when you're living in that kind of gratitude, you know, it's not hard to find the things that you are thankful for. And we don't need to wait for Thanksgiving just to, you know, to, to remind ourselves that we're thankful for. We need to do that every day. It's just one of those things that gets into the reticular activating system and then you, it just attracts more, you know. And so that's again, that's the abundance. That's where we, um, you know, we put out, you know, our thoughts, which are energy, which go out to the universe, which brings back what we what we think and what we know we deserve. So, you know, be putting out positive thoughts all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Got it. I, I love that too. I think something that I've started recently doing is like, uh, you know, a few things I think about in the morning and at night. And one of the things is like everything I'm thankful for. So like health, yeah. friends, family, you know, just great vibes in general. The fact that I'm able to, you know, run this podcast, but uh, it definitely helps me wake up feeling better and go to bed, uh, kind of go to bed feeling better as well. And, you know, I'm not yeah. perfect. I think, uh, but a lot of yeah. stuff that I've done in my past that I definitely could have done better, but, you know, trying to just get better one step at a time. So really great note on gratitude there. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you know, towards uh, the latter part of the episodes, I like to get in some of the more personal questions. So are you ready to to answer these these uh, for hot questions? Here for it. Awesome. So Clarissa, if you could go back and give advice to your 10-year-old self, what would it be? believe in yourself, just believe, don't be afraid because, you know, being afraid, uh, has been, um, one of the things that has really held me back being really afraid. Um, and so don't be afraid. Don't live in fear. It's, you know, face everything and, you know, rise, face everything and whatever it is, find your R, your own R word minus face everything and rise. I've got an, I just came up with another word. I can't remember what it was. Uh, face everything. What do I got? Face everything and redirect. Because to redirect mm -hmm. is my chapter four, is my fourth chapter and redirect. It's like, you know, when you're going through the fear, it's because your fear, a lot of time it's fear of rejection, right? And we have to remember that, you know, rejection is redirection. So face everything and redirect because again, rejection is redirection and, you know, keep trying. The other thing is the, you know, the fear of failure and just to be reminded again that, you know, uh, failure is your first attempt in learning. And so, nothing is perfect the first time. And, and, you know, I think that there's also a point where we have to go away. I failed. Okay. Mini little celebration. Okay. Every failure is that much closer to success. So um, I think that that's something we also have to give ourselves a little grace on. We have to give ourselves a little bit of forgiveness for maybe it's something you take to the mirror therapy work that you're going to do and say, you know, so what you failed, no big deal. You know, we know that that was your first attempt in learning. You'll do better next time. Um, and maybe, t you know, even taking the fear thing to the mirror and saying, yeah, you know, okay, okay. Gave you a little bit of time. We gave you a couple of days. We gave you a week. I'm afraid. Okay. But if you don't move forward, you're never going to know. You know, so you could take that to the mirror too and get some advice there. I think totally. that would be really and, Yeah. No, I think uh, I agree with everything you said. And may we all have a friend that if we're, we're feeling down ourselves or if we try to do something and we fail, that picks us back up and was like, look, it's no big deal. That's life. Just do something again or try something else and, you know, try your well, best. That's and why, move that. Yeah. That's why I talk about support groups. Because, um, you know, in your lifetime, in many people's lifetime, I think it's, it's been said many different times that, you know, you're really going to have that a really, really good friend that you can count um, on, on one hand, you know, and so who, who's your ride or die? Who's the one you call at three in the morning? Who is the one, you know, is always going to be there for you. And, um, who will you always be there for too? You know, it's, it is a two way C. My 12th chapter talks about reciprocal, right? So, um, the give and take of it all, uh, the yin and yang of it all. Um, and that's another one of the laws of the universe, right? So, um, making sure that you are the person that you need to be for them and, and, and really, um, having that peer group or peer person, a support system, friends is another really, really huge thing that we need to be, we need to, um, foster, um, for, you know, I'm going to say happy, healthy self-esteem, but definitely it's one of the kind of things that are going to make life easier for you. Definitely. Totally. I think that was an awesome word, definitely on sports groups. You know, uh, the other part of this fast, I've just honestly, while you were talking, something that came in my head is like calling these questions the fast five. So maybe I'll apply that moving forward. But um, 
Uh, the other question, besides reading your book, which sounds like a great read, by the way, and everyone should totally check it out if they're kind of looking yep. to struggling yep. with self-confidence or kind of grow their self-esteem. Are there any other books that you've read that have been really impactful to your life and it could be impactful uh, to each other? Yeah, first of all, yeah, first of all, I definitely, and this is, this is a fallback for a lot of people, and that is uh, Think and Grow Rich. Um, definitely Napoleon Hill. Do you know Napoleon Hill's work? Yep, I have. I'm not going to leave the the image, but I have I've read Think and Grow Rich. It's uh, it's in my my bookshelf. So that was a that was a really good book. Candidly, it took me um when I started reading it. Uh, I mean, I think I read it like a year ago or nine months ago, something like that. But even after I read it, I understood the biggest lesson in the book, which I think could be different for you know other people and how they interpret it. But I think the biggest lesson is you just kind of well, one success is different for everyone. I think that's like the yeah. biggest one of the most tangible lessons, but it's also in the sense that you kind of just approach everything with good faith and whatever happens, just always kind of figure out a way to get back up or pivot. So definitely read yeah. that book and think that the was a great read there. So. Mind, the subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. uh, Interesting. I, I remember who, oh God, I'm not good with the names of the authors. I'm sorry, the subconscious mind. Take a look at that. That's another really great book as well. I mean, I've got a library of this stuff in the back room. Uh, you're asking, I hate when people ask me what books I've read, because I've read so many, I can't remember a damn name. But those would be the first two that I would say, absolutely. Um, awesome. I was going through five other books last night. I'm st I've, 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 gotten a lot, I've gotten a couple of books right now about shadow work. And shadow work is when you really, you know, again, you, you stop and you take you you take a deeper dive into yourself much like mine does um and there's some really you know some really cool questions in there that are rather difficult to ask uh, answer so uh, i definitely do what is called the shadow work and um and when you're ready but let's get through some personal development stuff and then when you're all already get into shadow work which is kind of like the deeper darker part if you will of things that have happened to us and how we can bring that all to light to the light Got it. Totally. I think uh, the one shameless plug or the one thing that I think I've been thinking about lately is like, I think success, obviously when people think of success, they think of monetary success, by the way, but, and you know, I would love to hear your thoughts on this too, but it's almost like you're in a state of mind where you're constantly just kind of doing something, doing something. And even though you still go through challenges, have to make tough choices, it's almost like you're kind of in a state of mind of being at peace with the chaos and in some flow. And as you're fine with that, everything else just kind of, you know, comes your way. Yeah. Is there a question in there? Yep. Oh no, my I was I was gonna say like, have you have you um you know curious if you have like a, a similar no all good look it's uh, one of the biggest things before I uh, kind of asked the question one of the guests I had before Sean Murphy gave me great advice you know on live on the show and it's still in that episode he's like Daniel people love authenticity so mm -hmm. if you if you're not sure about something or you know don't edit everything out keep it there you know, not... trying to keep it as authentic but you know in your perspective like from a lot of people who are able to be really successful or specifically from your perspective doing a lot of these things. Do you think you're more focused on kind of like the monetary goal of it or you're just focused on like getting stuff done and doing good work and everything kind of yeah. went your way? Yeah, definitely the latter. Definitely the latter. You know, the monetary goal for me, again, I'm 64 years old. So I'm kind of like past, if you will, um, a lot of worried about money. I made my money. I, I, I was quite successful. I'm really good. So for me right now, um, I know the first part of my life, what I went through the things that I went through so that I could dedicate this part of my life to, um, you, you know, to putting into a book, to putting into words, to putting into a system, uh, to putting into a retreat, you know, to put, be putting into a workbook um, so that, um, you know, people will be able to learn uh, the things that I have to impart because I went through those things. Um, and so, again, I've, I'm so thrilled because I've gotten so many people that have written and just said, you know, the book has really changed their lives, which is which for an author is <laughs> is really, really well, probably the greatest you know compliment that I could um, that I could hope for. So I'm not as worried about the money. I'm, I'm really um, I'm more focused on, you know, even if I have another 40 or 50 years left, let's just say this, I'm telling my subconscious I'm going to be here forever. You know, that still is not a lot of time to reach a lot of people with a really, really important message. And that is, again, the importance of happy, health, self-esteem, the importance of doing the shadow work, the importance of, of personal development, the importance uh, of, of um, self-improvement, because it, again, it is your sacred duty to do that for yourself and for those that you will encounter along this lifetime. Got it. I think that was a, it was a beautiful answer and really appreciate you speaking to that. Um, Claire says, there are fun facts about you that not a lot of people know about or that you think would be cool to share. Oh, God, I don't know. I think that I won Survivor. I think you know that. Um, I've had two private audiences with Pope John Paul. Did you know that? 
no that's that's really actually i think i think i knew that but i don't think that's probably common knowledge <laughs> Yeah. Well, when I lived in Italy, I was there for 30 years and I worked on television there and I did a lot of, you know, charity work because I'm, you know, you're asked and I always said yes. And I was called into the Vatican to, um, to be recognized for the amount of social work that I did on it was like national volunteer day or something like that for one occasion. And then there was a second occasion where I had a private audience of Pope John Paul, which was really, really cool. Um, I also helped African women win the Nobel Peace Prize. Well, I was a part of the um, campaign to help women win the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011. That was a super crowning, 2001, 2011. That was a super crowning moment for me as well. Um, I was the first American to present at the Kremlin. Um, Interesting. So that, this is all documented, by the way. So um, yeah. that was a really cool moment. I mean, you know, I've had some, I've just, you know, I've done so many really cool things because I, I was driven. I was really focused. These are things that I wanted to do. Um, and I went out and, and did them and, you know, with all of the mistakes and all of the, you know, the heartache and the heartbreak and all of that, you know, you, it, it's what life is. It's, it's, it's an, it's just an amazing place to be. So we need to get out of, you know, victimhood and we need to get out of, Oh, what was me? And we need to get out of that's not fair. <laughs> just go make yourself a really good life. You know, you, you are the one that gets to write, you know, the, the, you get to be the writer, the director, the producer of your own life. So write a really good chapter that gets produced into a movie that, you know, you get to direct and you get to produce. Got it. Awesome. I, you know, that was a beautiful, beautiful way to answer that. And uh, really awesome fun facts there. And, you know, on that note of being able to do a lot of this fun stuff, you know, like, as I mentioned earlier, you know, and not to bore anyone, not honestly bore, but not to kind of say the whole list entire again, but you've done a lot of this uh, awesome stuff. Is there anything right now that in your life brings you the most happiness? Um, I really think that when I get the, um, the compliments about the book and the work that people are doing and how it is really changing their lives. I know that this was, again, I would have never written this book if it hadn't been for the opportunity that was presented to me. And we talked about that before. Um, but it would have just probably gone by the wayside if somebody had not come up to me and said, I got to write your book. That was a pivotal moment. That was something I really needed to jump on. And I knew that on the other side of that, it was going to be that important. It was just, it happened right after the Me Too movement that, uh, you know, Gary came to me and said, we need to do this book. And I went, well, let's do it. And then, you know, be able to pick, be picked up by a New York City publisher was every author's dream. So that was really, really cool. Um, I think that that, you know, the idea of now having the book and being able to be on podcasts like yours, Daniel, and just be able to, uh, you know, get the message out there is, is probably my, the thing that makes me the happiest. Um, because I know that, I know that people are, are lost. They are demoralized. They're hurting. They're they're They need help. They need assistance. They're looking for support. Um, they, they're, you know, the, the way out, the way forward in books like mine, um, again, you can walk into Barnes and Noble where again, I'm really thrilled to say my book is in there, but you know, the personal development aisle just keeps on going and going and going into the point that, you know, people are always looking for to be, to, to be, out of pain let's put it yeah. that way and to be a better person more than they are today which is what i offer up as well um we hear, often hear people say i am enough you are enough we are enough i am enough well i looked up the definition of enough daniel <laughs> and it goes like this only as much as is required so by definition the word enough isn't enough and what i do propose is this i am so much more than enough. Now, if you write that on a sticky note and you put it at your, your on your mirror, you put it near your computer, you put it in your workspace and, and refer to that frequently, I am so much more than enough. Talk to me in 30 days and let me know how your life has changed. Got it. I think uh, that was, that's awesome advice there and definitely a, a great purpose to have. And among that, you know, you've had a really illustrious life, really illustrious career. I uh, have been able to give some really great words of wisdom. Uh, you know, the last thing I always love to ask, Clarissa, you know, do you have anything else you want to share, whether it's relationship advice, life advice, business advice, final word is yours. Yeah, I think one of the most important things you have to remember is that whatever is meant for you will never pass you by. 
Another Got thing it. that I want to say, and I think it's really, really important, is that loyalty in all of this. Um, obviously, being loyal to yourself, but loyalty, in my definition, is this. Loyalty is when you've got my back behind my back. It's loyalty is when I've got your back behind your back. So, you know, that sort of takes away all the, you know, the two-faced, you know, falsehoods that we can encounter along the way. Um, so making sure that, you know, again, in the inner circle, in the really intimate part of your life, those five, six people that you let in, they're, that you, you know, they're well vetted and that you know that they're all about Daniel and that Daniel's all about them. Again, remember the reciprocity of it all. Got it. Totally. I think uh, I forget what the rapper's name was. So sorry for if this is the wrong person singing these lyrics, but I think it was Kendrick Lamar. And he said uh, in one of his songs, loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. So I think it's a great parting note. You've been an awesome guest and I you know, really appreciate yeah. you taking the time. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Clarissa Burt. If you like the episode, rate the show on Spotify, drop a comment on YouTube and subscribe.